It was dark, so dark, it was black inside their immurement. Maud and William could not see their hands in front of them, just faint sounds, a dripping sound from within their confines, the sound of their breath against the damp, stale air was heavy in their hearts. Faint voices could be heard in the distance from beyond the walls. They tried to call for help, <coughs> scream, but no one answered them. <coughs> Days passed and they both grew weaker. They had resorted to licking the walls just for a little sustenance. The damp, slimy walls had a little moisture dripping from them, but the fluid was gritty, salty, and seemed to dry their throats ever more. A week had passed, and William had grown silent. He had died. Maud knew she would be next, for hunger and thirst was uncontrollable. Her stomach was empty, her body was weak, yet with all her strength, she reached into the darkness and used her hands to find the way. At first, it was his shoulder she touched, then his wavy blonde locks, which felt dry between her fingers. She caressed her son's face, felt the contours of his nose and chin. Her finger even fell across his cold lips, just for a second. She pulled him in close to her. She closed her eyes. She wept as her mouth came across his cheek and her teeth sunk into the cold flesh. With one tear, she ripped from his face a piece of flesh and ate it. Welcome to the sixth of our 13 terrifying stories for Halloween. Today, we are going to take a deep dive into the life of Maud de Breos. This is a true story and makes up just one of the dark and twisted tales that exist in my family history. Yana and I would like to thank everyone for watching. Every time someone views our videos, you give us both encouragement to do what we love let us know how we are doing. Drop us a comment. And for more upcoming episodes, please subscribe to the channel. From Yana and I, we hope you enjoy the story. This is the story of Maud de Bros, a fiery, tempestuous woman who was frank in stating her opinion, but unfortunately, born in a time when that was not at all appreciated. Maud offended the highest power in the land and paid the ultimate price in a truly horrible way. Maud, or Matilda de Bros, was a woman beyond her time, known as a loud, outspoken kind of woman she was not always appreciated in a world dominated by men who believed women should be seen and not heard. And not really seen that much, apart from in the bedroom, where the men could make their sons and heirs. Maud was born Maud de Saint Valerie in France in about 1155. As was a woman's job in life, she was married off at a young age, eleven in fact, to William de Brose, fourth Lord of Bramba. When King John, also known as Prince John in the Robin Hood tales, came to the throne following the death of Richard the Lionheart, William de Brose became a great favourite of his and he and his wife moved to England to be a part of his court. For his loyalty, 
to the king, he was awarded the title and the estates of Lord of Limerick in Ireland. William was very military ambitious and Maud fully supported his decisions. By all accounts, their marriage turned into a love match and they were happy for a while, having at least 16 children. William trusted Maud so much that he put her in charge of Hay Castle while he was on campaign. This is a huge thing for those times, with women not generally having any power when it came to such matters. His trust was well rewarded when, in 1198, Maud defended another estate of theirs, Payne's Castle in Wales. Against a massive Welsh attack, Maud was successful in holding off the enemy forces for three weeks until English reinforcements arrived. Over a thousand Welsh soldiers were killed in this siege, and the castle was then known as Matilda's Castle by the locals. King John had quite a bad reign. He was prejudiced against to begin with, as his brother was well loved by the English people. Even though he left the country in tremendous debt when he died, John was also untrusted by his barons and was the reason for the Magna Carta's creation. The first document forced onto a King of England by a group of his subjects in an attempt to limit his powers by law and protect their privileges. He also had a bad habit of killing his hostages, including his young nephew Arthur. It is said that Maud, being the loud, outspoken individual that she was, did not hide her displeasure at the king and his ways. It is also said that the king found out what Maud had been saying very indiscreetly and fell out with Maud's husband, William, over it. By 1208, King John was in need of money. He created a plan to impose enormous taxes on his barons for their land holdings. He also wanted to confiscate all church property in order to ensure that the barons complied with his edict. He ordered all of them to provide him with hostages. Well, Maud was having none of that. She knew that being a hostage to the king meant nothing, and your life and health was not assured. So she answered the king's messenger, saying she would not give her sons as a hostage. As the king had the unsavoury habit of murdering people, the king was angry. How dare a woman speak to him in such a way and defy his edict? His first act was to confiscate all property belonging to the de Broses and also ordered all of the family captured. The family had been warned that this was going to happen and fled to Ireland, but King John was one step ahead of them and sent forces in pursuit, which ended with Maud and her son William being captured by the King's forces. They returned to England in chains and were imprisoned in Windsor Castle. They did not remain in Windsor Castle for long. They were soon transferred to Corf Castle in Dorset, at which time they were locked in a dungeon. And so the urban legend says, the door was bricked over and they were quickly forgotten about. Both Maud and her 11 year old son William starved to death in the cold, damp, dark prison, which in truth was their coffin. Many months had passed the shallow screams for help had faded and eventually fell silent. 
when their bodies were eventually recovered, it was found that Maud was the last to die. Hunger got the better of her and she had begun to feast on her son's dead body. A huge bite was found on her son William's cheek. She had eaten it. So crazed with starvation, thirst, solitude, that she turned to cannibalism. Those last few days of her life must have been unimaginable. Bricked up alive in Corfe Castle by England's most notorious king. Immunement takes its name from the Latin in, in, murus, wall. So it means in the wall, or walling in. An immured person could not expect to die quickly, for asphyxiation was generally not a risk. Instead, they would be left to die of dehydration or starvation. It was dark, so dark it was black inside their immunement. Maud and William could not see their hands in front of them. Just faint sounds, a dripping sound from within their confines. The sound of their breath against the damp, stale air was heavy in their hearts. Faint voices could be heard in the distance from beyond the walls. They tried to call for help, <coughs> scream, but no one answered them. Days passed and they both grew weaker. They had resorted to licking the walls just for a little sustenance. The damp, slimy walls had a little moisture dripping from them. But the fluid was gritty, salty, and seemed to dry their throats ever more. A week had passed, and William had grown silent. He had died. Maud knew she would be next, for hunger and thirst was uncontrollable. Her stomach was empty, her body was weak, yet with all her strength she reached into the darkness and used her hands to find the way. At first it was his shoulder she touched, then his wavy blonde locks which felt dry between her fingers. She caressed her son's face, felt for contours of his nose and chin. Her finger even fell across his cold lips just for a second. She pulled him in close to her. She closed her eyes. She wept as her mouth came against his cheek and her teeth sunk into the cold flesh. With one tear, she ripped from his face a piece of flesh and ate it. It was hard for her to chew and hard for her to swallow, but she did. And all through this ordeal, she wept like she had never wept before. Maud could not do it again. She pulled his lifeless body in close to her. She closed her eyes and she wished for death. She longed for it, begged for God to end her suffering. Death 